thank you thank you for coming both virtually and physically to to the jordan center my name is rosin jagalo uh, and i teach at the russian and slavic department uh, at nyu and it's my great pleasure today to be introducing my friend anna Ibinian, uh, to to all of you so anna grew up in armenia and her first degree was in biology which she then abandoned in favor of cultural studies a second bachelor's in cultural studies from Yerevan Pre-University for the Humanities. From there, she made it to the University of Michigan's Near Eastern Studies Department to study Iranian literature before transferring to, to Yale Slavic, where we met. Uh, I have to say, Ani is really one of the people I admire the most, and she overcame a great deal of adversity and obstacles, including her own shyness, <laughs> to become the scholar and teacher she is today. After her PhD at Yale, she held a um, short-term positions at Trinity College and the, and the University of Pennsylvania before moving to Kenyan College, where she's an associate professor Russian. These days, uh, she's working on a monograph uh, entitled Soviet Spirituality, Religious and Secular Humanism in the Post-Stalin Soviet Union, as well as an edited volume with Eliza Bovatsky on historical and transgenerational trauma in the former Soviet Union and countries of the socialist bloc. But today we've gathered to discuss her first book, uh, Formalists Against Imperialism, which came out last year from the University of Toronto Press. Uh, in which she posits that Yuri Tignanov's uh, novel from the 1920s, The Death of Vazir Mukhtar, uh, conceptualized Orientalism 50 years uh, before Edward Said coined the term. Um, analyzing literary and non-literary texts on Russia's relationship with Iran, Formalists against uh, imperialism studies Russian culture within the uh, framework of comparative colonialisms and examines the 20th century Russian reconsideration of the country's imperial past. Thank you, Anna, for coming. So first of all, um, I'm honored to be here. I would like to thank Jordan Center and personally, Rosan Jagalov. Uh, as I actually wrote in my acknowledgement in, in, for my book, Rosen is a kind of person that brings everybody together. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so um, uh, my talk is about the book and I thought, how should I structure my, my presentation? Should I talk about the entire book or choose some chapters? I decided to uh, go for a compromise. I, I would um, talk a little bit in depth about two of the chapters, in particular uh, chapters that deal with uh, the Russian avant-garde and its relation to um, imperialism and orientalism. Then I will talk maybe say a few words about some of the other chapters, uh, since they're, uh, they're very different, they were written in different periods of time and um, bring kind of different uh, facets uh, to, the, to the story. Um, and then I would be happy to answer your questions. So the main um, kind of thesis of the book is that in the 1920s, uh, the representatives of the Russian avant-garde, um, in particular, Yuri Tenyanov and Viktor Shklovsky, they had, uh, they formulated many of the ideas that uh, much later in the 1970s, uh, Edward Said, described as Orientalism. Um, I will also talk about the, the Futurists. Uh, in my book, there is this kind of a gradation. Uh, the formalists are more uh, aware of Orientalism and they appear to be more, more progressive than the Futurists. Um, but I will talk about it later. So, um, uh, I will talk about chapter two and chapter five. Chapter two deals with uh, the formalist, and chapter five deals with the future. Um, in chapter two, I discuss the following texts. 
Lili Tenyana, uh, the death of Vazir Mukhtar. Uh, this is one of uh, his three major uh, novels. Um, the one in the middle that he wrote after Kuchle and before Pushkin. Uh, it's probably the most avant-garde one, with Pushkin being much more realistic, while Kuchle being more of a young adult literature, um, also experimental, but not, not as kind of rich as uh, uh, the death of Vazir Mukhtar. So, um, as you probably know, um, the book uh, describes the life of um, Alexander Dibayev, the, the last year of his life, starting from him uh, bringing to Petersburg uh, the Tukhmachai Treaty, which uh, uh, was Persia uh, in the war that Persia uh, lost, the Russian-Persian war, which he actually um, helped to negotiate and uh, up to his uh, violent death in Tehran, when the Russian mission, uh, the, the, he, he, was, uh, he was leading the Russian mission uh, in Tehran, and he was attacked by an angry mob, and um, the entire mission died, including uh, in Bayern. So in my book, I show how uh, Benyanov, <clears throat> when I talk about him, uh, kind of describe his uh, Orientalism, he does it not in a uh, not as a scholar, but more as an artist. Um, so um, scholars um, viewed Benyanov's novel as this kind of a scholarly novel, or as very simply Byron calls it, a dissertation novel, in which he uh, studies historical and social topics through the artistic met methodology. So the main methodology is using uh, to kind of study Russian Orientalism of the 19th century is parody, which is also very kind of um, uh, typical of, of the formalists. They studied parody. Uh, they uh, talk a lot about intertextuality. Uh, they thought that not only actual parodies, but any literary work is intertextual and always um, uh, always works and comments on, uh, on the writings of, of uh, the predecessors. So in uh, the death of Martin Mukhtar, Benyanov um, carried this Russian 19th century romanticism uh, with its um, nationalism and um, a kind of imperial uh, um, Support support for imperial uh, uh, expansion. Um, uh, in this particular chapter, I'm talking about Pushkin's journey to Arturo, although uh, Benyanov also made that use parody parodies of Pushkin's poetry, especially his southern poems uh, like uh, the Fountain of Pachisara, uh, the Prisoner of the Caucasus. So um, um, he is engaging with Pushkin's journey to our room in two ways. First, he wrote uh, the novel, uh, The Death of Vladimir Mukhtar, which is about Rivayedev, but Pushkin appears there even more prominently in some way, in some kind of ideological, cultural way than Rivayedev himself. And then uh, later, so uh, he, he wrote an article on the journey to our room, where he's trying to uh, formulate what he uh, intuitively found through parody in his uh, in his novel, uh, he also juxtaposes uh, Pushkin's journey to Ark's room with uh, the journey of his um, fellow formalist and contemporary Viktor Shklovsky. Uh, in his um, uh, in his book, A Sentimental Journey, Memoirs, 1917-1922, uh, which was published in 1923, uh, so Shklovsky. Mm, he's a very interesting figure. During the uh, World War I and uh, Russian uh, Civil War, he participated very actively. Uh, he was um, a trainer for an uh, armored car during World War I. Uh, then during the Russian Civil War, he was an SR, socialist revolutionary. Um, he had to go to hiding for, for a certain time, came back. Um, at a certain time of his life, he found himself in Persia as an assistant commissary, uh, uh, and um, 
at a certain point, he was responsible for bringing Russian troops back. So Russian troops um, invaded uh, uh, Iran during World War I, and now after the revolution, there was time when uh, they had to uh, come back. So Shklovsky <clears throat> alludes in his sentimental journey to Lawrence Stern's sentimental journey through France and Italy. Uh, what connects the two works is this idea of um, one thread in the Enlightenment uh, that um, um, morality and ethics are based not on, on reason, like, for example, Kant thought, but on emotions and, and feelings, uh, which um, is book based on Adam Smith's uh, book, The Fear of Moral Sentiments, where he writes that our morality is based uh, on a, a so-called fellow feeling, which is uh, which we now call empathy. Um, and Kunyano um, in his novel also alludes uh, to, um, to the book of Radishiv, Journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Radishiv was a representative of the Enlightenment, was anti-imperialist. He also wrote about uh, the importance of indiv an individual. Uh, no uh, human being is insignificant. And um, the way Tinyanov, so both Shkowski and Tinyanov alludes to Radishev, and the way they do that is through the, what Bakhtin calls the passionate word of the Enlightenment, a style that uh, enli the Enlightenment writers use when they um, use exclamations or questions and addressing the, the, uh, the reader uh, directly. And of course, uh, there is also this interplay with Pushkin's journey from Moscow to Petersburg, which Pushkin wrote as a, a way of um, kind of uh, criticizing Radishev's, Radishev's work. Uh, although um, I think Tenyanov thinks that um, through irony, uh, Pushkin actually brought attention to Radishev work. He, he wasn't criticizing it, he wanted it to stay kind of. Uh, stay in the view of, of, of the reader and not, not to be forgotten. Um, now I'll show you how uh, Tenyanov is uh, using uh, uh, using parody uh, to kind of reveal uh, Pushkin's uh, kind of support of imperialism and um, orientalism. Um, so in his article on the journey to our room, Tinyana describes how Pushkin wrote this journey, which looks like a memoir, but it's not a memoir. It was written um, six years after uh, Pushkin went to Arzurum, which was during the Russo-Turkish War of 1928-1929. Um, and when he was writing it, he used extensively uh, sources. He presented it as a, some kind of a scholarly work, for example, using footnotes. And as uh, Tenyana shows it, it was a mystification. Some of these uh, uh, footnotes weren't even true. And he used how uh, Pushkin was using the, the sources uh, and uh, slightly changing the wording completely change, changed its meaning. And Tenyana does the same with Pushkin's text, The Journey for Azro. For example, he takes two passages from Pushkin's journey. Um, Sergation's haters, we force them out of the spacious pastures. The owls are ravaged, entire tribes are annihilated. Uh, they keep the prisoners with the hope of ransom, but treat them with terrible inhumanity, force them to work beyond their ability, feed them with raw dough, beat them whenever they want to, and assign guarding uh, to their boys for, uh, for a single word have the right to slash them with their child's sabers. The impact of luxury may be favorable for taming them. The samovar would be an important innovation. There is a means more powerful, more moral, more in conformance with the enlightenment of our age, preaching of the gospels. And another passage, um, several women in multicolored uh, tattered clothing were sitting on the flat roof of an underground sakra. I expressed myself somehow. One of them went down to the circular and brought out some cheese and milk to me. After several minutes of rest, I set out for them. So Tanyanov takes these two passages and combines it in, in one passage, uh, which reads, um, 
uh, women in multicolored tatters were sitting on a stone, a flat roof of an underground sapler, a boy with a child saber was dancing in the rain. Some tea said Pushkin, uh, he dismounted and took shelter under the stone awning. They brought out some cheese and milk. Pushkin threw their money. The rain stopped um, as suddenly as it had started. He set out far, uh, farther and looked back. The boy walked about in a puddle. The women were following him with their eyes. The influence of luxury and Christianity could tame them, he thought. So it's a that was called, uh, would be important means. <laughs> so, so in this passage, first of all, he puts this um, uh, idea of a child with a saber. It, it becomes a toy saber that a, a child is just playing. Uh, he mm, underscores the complete miscommunication because Pushkin is asking for tea and uh, the women bring cheese and milk. Uh, he uh, shows uh, Pushkin as somebody who is very condescending and throws money to, to these women. Uh, he also underscores um, the subjectivity of Pushkin's um, viewpoint by showing that the women themselves were kind of observing him. Um, and finally, he takes two different sentences from Pushkin's um, journey and combining them together um, in one, in which the luxury is in Christianity. And some of our gospel become something equal of, of an equal equal value. And then in his article on the journey uh, to our hero, uh, he then goes even farther, and he says, uh, "Father Pushkin develops this idea of missionary work in the focuses the Samovar and Christianity, such as the formula of uh, colonial politics." He suggests. So it comes up with this formula of some of art and Christianity, which can also be a part of uh, Vladimir Gibbius' book, uh, Pushkin and Christianity, in which uh, he wanted um, to kind of, uh, um, I, I think Diana wanted to show how different um, cultural and literary uh, circles are using Pushkin to kind of prove, prove their own, uh, own point. Um, so, uh, what uh, Daniel shows in his uh, novel and uh, uh, kind of says in, in his article is that Pushkin was pondering this. Uh, he uh, he ends he ends his article on on uh, the journey uh, to Arsiru. Uh, uh, kind of talking, to, he mostly talks about Pushkin's um, literary devices, but at the end he go, he talks about Pushkin's moral uh, stance, and he says that um, in uh, in uh, the focus of the next room, he uh, was confronted with uh, some uh, colonial practices and policies that was uh, immoral, and he had to deal with that and kind of um, think about it. Um, and still, neither Pushkin nor Gribaedov, um, even though they would criticize some some uh, colonial policies, they weren't in principle against uh, imperialism or against colonization, uh, which is uh, completely different with um, uh, the text of uh, Tenyanov's fellow formalist Shkovsky, who openly uh, denounces denounces colonialism. Um, so Shklovsky, um, as you probably very well know, um, he has this idea of estrangement, a literary device that makes uh, us um, see something anew. Uh, for example, see the world from the point of view of a horse, uh, like it in this uh, story. Um, and the, in general, he, he thought that the uh, function of art is to, to this um, bringing back the sensations we, which are worn out during our everyday life. Uh, now, among this uh, sensation, uh, I think uh, a very important sensation is the sensation of pain. Shklovsky writes that guinea pigs uh, with cut leg, leg nerves know of their own toes. The world that together with art lost the sensation of life is now committing a monstrous suicide. He writes it about World War One. 
the war uh, in our time um, of that art passes by consciousness and that explains its uh, cruelty. Uh, so, Shkovsky uses this uh, principle of estrangement is his own journey, the sentimental journey. So, for example, here uh, in this passage, uh, after the explosion, the soldiers who were surrounded by the enemy occupied themselves with collecting and putting together the torn bodies of their friends. They were collecting for a long time. Of course, they mixed up the body parts of many. One officer walked up to a long row of corpses. The last deceased was put together from constituent parts. Uh, it was a trunk of a large man placed against. It was a small head, and on the chest there were small uneven hands, both of them left. The officer kept looking for a rather long time, then he sat on the ground and started to laugh, laugh, laugh. So, um, using this point of view of an officer who kind of laughs at seeing the corpses um, as a device of estrangement, uh, Shklovsky shows uh, the de dehumanizing effect of the war. This particular uh, passage is from Persia. Um, so it's not just a war, but it is an imperialist war um, in which a, a person can be put together as, a, as an object, as a puzzle. So Tanyana in his, in his uh, uh, parody, so if Shkowski does estrangement, Tanyana actually do his, doing this bearing, uh, bearing the device. He actually names, names says the, the, the word object. Um, so soon, Black House, this is about uh, the time when they discovered Grimaenda and the, the Russian mission. So Black House ordered bodies and uh, body parts were found. They threw them on the surface of the ditch and they laid side by side looking alike as if the same factory manufactured them under the same number. Uh, only some were missing arms, other le others legs, and they were also completely anonymous objects um, having no names. So it, it, he kind of takes uh, Shkowski's idea to um, its combination and actually names what Shkowski is doing. Um, so Shkowski's journey uh, is, um, I said it was a dialogue with Lawrence Stern's journey, but of course the part about Persia is, uh, um, always in dialogue with uh, Pushkin's uh, journey to Arzu. Um, so Pushkin uh, writes in journey to Arzu. Um, this passage is, uh, by that time, it's already a cliche uh, that uh, people who go to the Orient and expect to find uh, find it being luxurious and interesting and exotic are disappointed. Um, I do not know an expression that would be more meaningless than the word as Asiatic luxury. This saying was probably born during uh, the Cru Crusades when the poor knights living behind the bare walls and oak chairs uh, of their castles for the first time So red sofas, motley carpets and daggers with multicolored gems on their candles. Now one could say Asiatic poverty, Asiatic squalor, etc. But luxury is of course the attribute of Europe. In our room, no amount of money uh, will buy you the things that you will find at a convenience store in the little town of Skok province. So this is the attitude that actually um, uh, unites Pushkin and Gribayev. Um, and many, um, many uh, kind of intellectuals and representatives of nobility of that time. Um, uh, it, First, uh, it's this kind of Eurocentrism. Uh, and uh, second, uh, this idea that uh, while back in Russia, they may think that Russia is kind of both East and West, when they are in the East, uh, they are the Europeans. So Skol becomes Europe. Uh, now, Shkowski uh, uses the same um, um, idea of somebody who comes to the East and kind of expecting it to be exotic and is disappointed. He came to the East and expected it to be multicolored like a peacock's tail. What he saw was a, an East made of clay, straw, and an entirely bare wall. Um, however, according to Shklovsky, uh, he kind of historicizes this and he says, um, uh, 
he blames um, in, imperialist war of the situation which in which the East finds itself. So uh, it is not because uh, the East is a kind of uh, backward. Uh, it's not uh, an essentialist um, idea of the East, but that, that is because it is occupied by Western powers. Uh, he says, we came to somebody else's country, occupied it, added to its darkness and violence our own violence. We constrained its trade. We did not let it open factories. We supported the Shah, uh, which goes kind of against this idea of civilizing mission of Russia or Western powers. In Iran, Shkovsky actually shows how both Russia and uh, the Britain, and then late in the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, also the US, um, they actually uh, hold, they're holding back uh, Middle Eastern countries because it's easier for them to deal with um, despotic regimes rather than allowing the countries to develop. Um, Uh, also, unlike Pushkin, um, whose stance is more nationalist, uh, Shklovsky is a universalist uh, he, uh, um, and a, a humanist. So while in Iran, he sends his um, telegram to his commissary, in the name of revolution and love of humanity, I demand the withdrawal of the troops. And then he says, uh, the commissary did not like the telegram very much. After all, it is naive and funny to demand the withdrawal of the troops um, in the name um, of humaneness, but I was right. Um, he talks about uh, the necessity to, to uh, do, instead of trying to make history, to make biography, in other ways, to, to live decent lives for uh, each person. And um, Dinyanov actually, Write biographies. All three of his fiction books are biographies. In, in some ways, it also kind of uh, emphasizes that um, individual responsibility. Um, so, th this was just a kind of short overview uh, of, of that chapter. If you have more questions, I can talk about it more uh, in depth later. Uh, now, chapter five is about uh, the engagement of, of, of futurists. Um, Kaminsky and Hlebnikov uh, was um, so these are also kind of viewed from the point of view of Tenyanov because Tenyanov also makes parodies of his futurist friends who use um, uh, the story of Stepan Razin uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in their art. So Stepan Razin, you probably already very well know, no, it's a dog Cossack who led an uprising against the nobility and Tsarist bureaucracy in, in the 17th century. So for two years prior to his Volga uprising, he, uh, he engaged in raids of Persian and Caucasian coastal cities of the Caspian Sea. He also, uh, for a short time, uh, had um, this kind of autonomous <laughs> Uh, um, autonomous state in Astrakhan and a similar one in Persia when he had a uh, kind of agreement with the, with the Shah, uh, it was given a land, uh, if, uh, which uh, Tanyanov compares to kind of um, a Gribayetov. He thinks that Gribayetov who wanted to open a um, Russian trans transportation trading uh, and manufacturing and agricultural company wants to create in a Caucasus as kind of a, his own little uh, independent land. Um, so other texts I will be talking about is Gribayeda's short um, article, uh, like an essay, country trip, in which he kind of admires Russian folklore, songs, and Russian dress. Uh, I will be talking about Vasily Kamensky, who wrote a poem, uh, actually two poems on Stenka Razin, then later reworked them into a novel and, and a play. Uh, Hlebnika worked uh, in Persia as a Kulpresvet lecturer in the headquarters of the Russian Revolutionary Army that was helping the short-lived Republic of Gilan. And uh, Kurat al um is a thinker and poet, uh, and Hlebnika alludes to her is in, in his poems. 
so in his uh, in his novel, uh, Denyanov portrays Gribayedov as Stenkarazi. He makes this kind of allusion. Um, uh, so according to a popular uh, song by Mary Sadovnikov, um, I don't know if I should recall the song, but Stenkarazi uh, abducts a, pre a Persian princess. And then um, uh, he, he is engaged in a feast on a boat, and his crew starts murmuring and saying that he, um, he exchanged them for a, for a woman, and then he, he throws her in the water. And then the crew becomes kind of um, sad, and he said, don't be sad, and um, tells them to, to sing and dance. So um, Danyanov makes parodies of this, uh, portraying Gribayed of himself as uh, Stan Karazin, and of course, his Georgian wife, uh, Nina Chakravata, is uh, the, the Persian princess. So why does he, why is he doing that? Because Gribayedov, in his uh, little essay, um, Country Trip, he admires uh, the deeds of uh, those days. And Stan Karazin, uh, he says, by God days, how vividly this folk uh, whole game revives you in my memory, that age of unbridled freedom when a number of daring fellows threw themselves into light boats, went down the channel of Tuba, the Bozan River, there to go into the open sea, took tribute from the coastal cities and villages, sparing neither the beauty of the maidens nor the gray hair of the old. And then getting rich with profits with countless amounts of fat and fabric, silver and gold pearls, they came back home with love and friendship of, uh, awaiting, awaiting them. They welcomed them with a loud joy and glorified them in songs. So first of all, uh, uh, it seems like Yubayet is, um, is okay with this kind of clandering, uh, the idea of raids, which is in parallel with Shkowski's sentimental journey, one of the uh, things that bothers Shklovsky most was that uh, the soldiers uh, of the Russian army uh, from, for whom he was responsible were looting the bazaars and he would run around and try to prevent that looting uh, and he would write, uh, it was strange, a man is riding, running with a dagger in his hand and this road ice, you catch him, shake him and he has two gilded frames, two boots for the left foot and a few handfuls of raisin, raisins. Again, he's using this kind of a estrangement uh, thing. And he, he said that in each army, maybe 75% of people are good people, but they do nothing to prevent the, the 25% from looting and um, uh, being violent. Um, so another uh, reason why uh, Tanyanov was talking about Gribayedov as Stinkarazin was because uh, the motive of Stinkarazin was used very much in um, futurist, po futurist poetry. And the futurists, uh, um, Kaminsky and Hlipnikov, they were trying just like uh, Gribayedov did in, in his time, according to, to Tanyanov. Uh, they were uh, archives and innovators. In other words, they were trying to bring uh, innovation through using old folkloric motifs um, and culture. Uh, so in, in uh, the death of Mazen Mukhtar, there is this moment in which Gabayedov is sitting in his room and he's thinking about this song, old song that he wanted to create and never did. The song was wandering in him, aching, brewing, fermenting and scattering. Now, when he grew old, and they took off the youth from him as a tight dress, he understood that he wanted to construct a simple, outright rush, Russian ancient song, a midnight tale of a new Eagles campaign. Um, so again, uh, this kind of a more um, nationalist inclined uh, vision of the futurists who went back to the folkloric roots is kind of juxtaposed to formalist, more um, universalist um, uh, attitudes. So, uh, Shklovsky's sentimental journey was in dialogue with uh, the journey from uh, Arthur 
by Pushkin, uh, and so was Hlebnikov's entire kind of uh, experience um, in, uh, in the Orient. So, uh, in the journey for, uh, from as room, Pushkin uh, de describes as room uh, as this kind of a ridiculous uh, city where there are this uh, this uh, uh, stone houses uh, with funny roofs which have turf on it. And Hlebnikov sees the same kind of houses, but finds them very charming and the entire experience is uh, very pleasant for him. So he says, Anzali consists of many little uh, tile houses covered with uh, carpets of green moss with, with pretty red flowers, golden orange, and for the house, uh, beat the branches of the trees, dervishes with knotty staffs uh, that look like swirling uh, snakes with austere faces uh, of prophets fill the streets with their singing. So this is another kind of a parallel with Pushkin's journey uh, in which um, Pushkin made fun of uh, him being called a dervish. Uh, so Hlemnikov uh, was very proud that he was called in Persia Urus dervish, Rash Russian dervish, and that he was uh, welcomed as uh, their own. Uh, Ours sang the priest of the mountains, ours sang the flowers, ours sang the oak woods and groves. So in the journey for us room, Pushkin um, uh, retells the incident when he is met with a prisoner of war, Ottoman uh, official, who praises, uh, well, uh, upon finding out that Pushkin is a poet, poet, poet uh, praises him in such a way. Uh, blessed is the hour when we meet the poet. The poet is a brother of a dervish. He has neither fatherland nor earthly comforts. And while we, the wretched ones, care for fame, power, treasures, he stands on the level with the lords of the earth, and everyone worships them. And then Pushkin, with self irony, says that he was very flattered with, with this. Uh, but then Fox Swan and himself uh, later saying that a young man helped make it in a Sheepskin head with a club in his hand and a sheepskin, uh, sheepskin on his back. He was uh, yelling at the top of his lung. Uh, they told me that he was my brother, a dervish, uh, who came to greet uh, the victors. Uh, they were barely able to drag, drag him away. So unlike Pushkin, Hlebnikov was very proud uh, of the title of a dervish. Uh, he called himself Gyulmula, Gyul which is a priest of flowers. And he wrote nothing in Persia is as honorable as being the Gil Mala Springs treasurer of golden, golden ink. So he was uh, working uh, 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 as a lecturer for Quit Prasvet. Um, and uh, although um, his lect lectures weren't that uh, valuable at all, he spent most of the time in uh, Czech Anas tea, tea houses. Uh, um, uh, smoking opium while his friend, uh, uh, artist Dabrakovsky, would sketch people and uh, draw caricatures. Um, even, even uh, despite of that, uh, uh, people thought that he is a very kind of useful tool in building this kind of intercultural relation, bringing uh, closer together the Persians and, and the Russians. So, this, this, that, despite the explanations of this. Step agitators, Riva and Savit, rightly considered them to be absolutely dispensable workers. Within the religious and relieving conditions of that time, with the very attention towards the Russian revolutionaries who carried on their banners quite um, extraordinary slogans, Russian dervishes, in a way that is hard to explain, strengthened our political positions. So this is a little bit condescending sentence saying that uh, the Iranians would only understand uh, the revolution in which it, it's coming in this kind of a religious, uh, religious form uh, from uh, the point of view of Russian dervishes. Um, okay, so first I'll, I'll say a few things about, if I have time, um, I'll just say a few things about Kaminsky's, Kaminsky's uh, engagement with Stinkerazin and then talk about uh, Hlebnikov Stinkerazin. So Kaminsky wrote his uh, poem uh, first in 1912. Um, at that time, uh, uh, 
the poem was very close to um, to what Zadovnikov describes in, in his song. Um, so Russian avant-garde was fascinated with uh, the, the figure of Stepan Razin because he was con considered to be a revolutionary, some kind of precursor of the Decembrists. And even Lenin um, gave a speech about Stepan Razin on Lovna Mesta when Stepan Razin was executed. Uh, where there, uh, there was a short-lived uh, monument uh, erected to Stepan Razin. Uh, Stepan Razin and his crew were made out of wood, and the Persian princess was made of, out of concrete. Uh, but uh, it wasn't very lasting because wood wouldn't kind of um, last in, in the conditions um, uh, of the winter, but uh, Lenin talked about Stepan Razin as a, a freedom uh, fighter. So, uh, in most of the writings about Stepan Razin of Silver Age and avant-garde poetry, uh, they saw no, no problem in uh, Stepan Razin drowning uh, the Persian princess. He was considered to be uh, this kind of a protector of the poor, and uh, his violence was justified because it was a revenge against the, the Tsarist officials and, and uh, the rich. Um, mm, um, actually, only one person um, out of um, Silver Age poets, uh, Maria Tsitaeva, described uh, this whole incident as sexual violence. Uh, she, she, she said that in her poem uh, that the princess was drowned because she couldn't reciprocate the, the love of um, Sipan Razin. So the story, uh, there were two people who kind of um, told that story, they were both Dutchmen. One was a salesmaker and another was an officer in the Russian army. But basically the story doesn't have um, many details. It just said that he abducted the Persian princess and then sacrificed her to the Volga River. So uh, then later, uh, for a one year anniversary of revolution, Kaminsky reworked his poem into a, a novel and, and then a play. And at that time, uh, he already had to kind of uh, think about um, revolutionary internationalism. And it was not okay that uh, the princess was drowned and he had to somehow justify that. Uh, so um, first of all, it's it's a long story. I'm, I'm uh, if you're interested, I can tell it later, but uh, in that story, there are many actors, and there are rich uh, Persians and poor Persians, and poor Persians, and also the women of the harem, uh, the kind of oppressed women of the East. They support Razin against their own uh, 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 their own prince, the Persian prince. Uh, Persian princess uh, voluntarily joins uh, Stepan Razin, and then when they travel. Uh, to Volga region, she says that she loves the poor people, she loves the poor people of Persia and the poor people of Russia. And then at the end, she just tells him to uh, throw her in the river so she will go back home because she misses home. So kind of absolves her of, of, his, uh, of his guilt. And then uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, lament, lamentation instead of uh, um, laughing and dancing, uh, Stepan Razin, uh, uh, sings this lamentation of this uh, swan who flew away from, from him. And uh, this motif of the swan appears many times in, in, Tenyanov's, in, in Tenyanov's novel. Now, uh, Lebrikov, uh, instead of kind of justifying Stepan Razin, he decided that he himself is Stepan Razin, but he is the uh, uh, Stepan Razin uh, the reverse. Uh, so, I am rising the office, I am rising inside out. He plundered and burned, and I am the, uh, an idol of the world, uh, Slovo Barok. Uh, rising drowned the maiden in water, what will I do quite the reverse? I will save her. Uh, so it's interesting that um, he kind of, in his uh, article, uh, Tenyanov writes about, about Hlebnikov as someone who, in, in this poem, uh, uh, Gilmola's Trumpet, creates uh, an orient which is not uh, presented from the point of view of a European. In other words, it's, it's not 
condescending, neither uh, neither it treated is with kind of a uh, exaggerated respect or tries to see um, exoticism in it. Um, I think Tanyanov kind of gives Hlebnikov his own uh, ideas more because when you actually look at Hlebnikov's poems, uh, you can see some of the kind of orientalist tropes in that. First of all, this idea that he has to go to the Orient and save it. And uh, the Orient is represented by a, a woman who needs to be saved. Uh, in the poem, No Rules of Labor, he, it's a long, little longer poem. Uh, he started with describing the men of, of Iran as this um, marching um, uh, workers. Uh, he calls them uh, Adam after Adam they walk which is a pun because uh, on the one hand, uh, Hlebnikov was an atomist, which is a, a branch of uh, atomism in which they want to see the world as if for the first time uh, with, the, with the eyes of the first person who, uh, born uh, on the earth, Adam. Uh, but Adam also means simply a human being in, uh, or a man. In, in Persian, so it's, it's, it's kind of a uh, pun. Uh, but they, uh, they're represented as having agency and uh, you, you should believe that there will be freedom brought to Persia from within Persia itself. But then when he describes women, uh, he says, Further on, as parents on the porch of Russian freedom, locked up uh, by a jealous dungeon, austere and maidens of Islam, enveloped in a black chador, they're awaiting a liberator. So it goes back to this idea of, kind of liberating the woman, uh, uh, woman of the Orient. Um, then again, there is some hope that there is an agency even in women of, of, of the Orient because it talks about uh, Kurat al Ay, now who uh, names Gulliet in Ay. It just occurred to me that maybe it's a panel on Gulliet, and uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so, Kurat al Ay was a, a poet and a thinker of the 19th century uh, who participated in the Babi movement. Um, which was a religious movement. Uh, so her ideas were that um, people uh, kind of spiritual, spiritually people constantly evolve. And because of that, um, the situation, the current situation in which she lived was a transitional situation in which there is there was no new kind of divine emanation late yet, but the old uh, dogmas, religious dogmas and rituals don't have any sense, don't make any sense anymore. So during the assemblies of kind of Babi movement, she would not wear uh, a, a veil uh, and to kind of protect her from any um, ideas that uh, that was impure. Bab himself co called her Tahire, the pure one. So um, she thought uh, that uh, there need to be a freedom of inquiry and uh, uh, open debate about religious um, issues in which a truth can be found out. Uh, because of that, uh, this position, uh, she was kind of at odds with, with the uh, government of the day. And when a group of Babis uh, assassinated the Shah, she was, uh, she was executed um, in a garden, uh, there are several um, uh, versions of it, where she was either staring over her hair or over with her headscarf and put in a, uh, in a well. So um, Kremnikov mentions all of this. Uh, so we swear by the hair of Gurian and I, we swear by the golden mouth of Zarathustra, Persia will be a Soviet country, this uh, thus spoke the prophet. Uh, Gurit al Ay, Tairi herself tied on the ends of the rope, said and asked the executioners, turning her head, uh, nothing else. So, aside from kind of uh, allusion to Nietzsche, there is also uh, allusion to um, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, Zlatyusta, 
so he combines uh, Christianity and Zoroastrianism. But he portrays Kurata uh, uh, Allen with having this agency and kind of uh, not bending down in front of her in executioners. So, so yeah, uh, Hlebikov had this kind of idea that he is going to save somehow Persia with his mysticism, his magical numbers, uh, with his futurist poetry. And he did kind of think of revolution, revolution in his religious terms. Uh, he said, leaving Baku, I started studying Mirza a Persian prophet, and I will give a lecture about him here, both of the Persians and the Russians, Mirza Bab and Jesus. I told the Persians that I am a Russian prophet. So uh, later, the Babi movement uh, transformed into Baha'i movement, which was less violent, and it was uh, a pacifist movement. And actually, um, one of my um, supervisors, Professor Abbas Amanat, was um, uh, from a Baha'i family. Um, uh, so. Uh, while Kurat al Ain in Hlemnika's poem says agency while she's alive, after she dies, she becomes the land, the Iranian land herself. Uh, it is her body, the snowy mountains, the dark nostrils of the mountains, evidently draw in the smell of rising, the wind from the sea, I am on my way. So when she becomes the land, it kind of brings again back this trope of the uh, the, the land of the Orient, which is at the same time the woman who awaits uh, to be to be saved by uh, somebody uh, from the West or from Russia, uh, like like Stepan Razin. So we are um, are out of time. Um, I mean, we be maybe slowly. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that there are other chapters. Um, I can just say in, in in few words. So one one is of colonial management of Transcaucasia and the ideas of the European Enlightenment. So when I started uh, working on Tiniana's uh, book about Gebaeta, I understood in the book uh, this um, establishing of the Russian Transcaucasian company was treated as. Gribaeda's main project of his last year. And I found out that it was very little understood uh, on the kind of um, political and historical and economic background of the project. So this chapter one is kind of introductory chapter that talks about Gribaeda, his project and how it was influenced by the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, in particular by um, Abbe Renal and Denis Den Diderot. While those who criticized him were more influenced by Adam Smith, Smith uh, work on uh, inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. So, if you uh, have questions on it, I can talk uh, about more in depth about that. There is a chapter on uh, the fountain of Bachisarai in which Pushkin views. <clears throat> Pushkin views Russia as the owner of a harem, in which uh, the Caucasus and Poland are like the two women in the fount of Bachesara. We know that there, is a, uh, there was a Polish, uh, Polish girl and a Georgian girl who was um, jealous of her, and um, which kind of was Pushkin's idea. Um, so in, in this parody, uh, Denyanov treats Russia as the uh, owner of harem. Um, <clears throat> and it um, kind of undermines this idea of um, mutually beneficial marriage between Russia and Georgia. Uh, and Bibayedov uh, in this marriage to Nina Chakravadze was a symbol of this mutually beneficial marriage. So we may not have that. that. Uh, chapter six, the treacherous eunuch. Uh, he talks about the uh, Mirza Yakub, the eunuch of Fatal Shas, Kajak's harem, uh, Shas treasurer. Um, so I look at it in terms of uh, Montesquieu's Persian letters, in which uh, uh, it kind of explains the nature of uh, uh, despotism. That it cannot be built only on uh, fear, but on, also on some kind of a social promise and promotion. Uh, in, in Persian letters, uh, 
the wives rebel, but the eunuchs don't rebel because um, they are in it, they gain position and wealth. Uh, but in Vinyana's work, uh, he actually portrays this eunuch as a person who wants to go back to the place of his birth and this kind of authentic person. And in doing so, he uh, there are lots of intertextual allusions to Chekhov's Kashtanka. Uh, which is about a dog who was lost and then finally recovers it, its pre previous uh, owners. Um, and finally, there is a chapter about um, after Kibayda's death, there was a delegation from Iran led by um, the, the grandson of the Shah. And um, we have um, diaries of, of, of that uh, visit on the Iranian side, and I compare them to the way how Tanyana portrays them in, in, in his novel. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. This is fantastic. So uh, yes, we have time for questions. So we have two audiences, uh, virtual and a real one. And if uh, the virtual audience, you know, whoever wants to ask a question would raise their virtual hand, that would help, but uh, maybe we can start with the real one and with Gillian. I have a question, thank you so much. Um, I was delighted by the suggestion that Tanyana had written a dissertation novel, and I was thinking about, so if the dissertation novel is one in which parodies of 19th century Russian Orientalist texts provide the kind of theoretical claims. Um, if we were thinking about what the lit review section of that dissertation novel would be, where there would be uh, identification of previous works that had done something similar, I'm just wondering what would be in the lit review? I mean, what would have been the precedents, I guess, um, that you see or Tinyana exposing through parody and really theorizing Russian Orientalism. And I was just wondering if, if Pushkin could be one of those. Yeah. <laughs> with that uh, commentary in particular on luxury and the yeah. head of... Yeah, um, that's, that's a very good question because uh, uh, I think that's what Lenyana thought himself, at least uh, later when he uh, reworked it into an, an article on Pushkin that Pushkin uh, use irony that it wasn't something he thought, but in in those position uh, in those uh, that historical situation, it really did. He, he could only use irony to uh, kind of express his ideas. I personally, I'm not sure. I I'm not so sure. I think the entire kind of cultural attitude of the time was um, very much permeated by nationalism and. Um, competition between empires and everybody wanted their empire to be like, competitive and uh, the um, condemnation of imperialism came, came later, maybe in the second half of the 19th century, much stronger than the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, yeah, but uh, the idea of um, a scholarly novel, it's discussed by Ichim Baum. Um, uh, in that, uh, Bakhtin thought that any novel as a synthetic genre is, is a combination uh, of other genres which it uses in this kind of a more ironic uh, form. So any novel could be described as, as a dissertation novel, but in Tenyana's novel in particular, there is almost no sentence that doesn't allude to some predecessor. Right now I'm teaching a course on War and Peace. And I find so many allusions that back then I didn't think about it because I was thinking from the point of view of Orientalism, but almost everything is alluding to something else. Uh, thank you so much. It, it's very, it's very interesting talk. And uh, I also, it's a very original perspective on like, even when we, we think about the uh, like the characters of, of that you are talking about here, that like Pushki and Levnikov uh, and um, you know Shkolsky, Vinyanov. When you just name those those names, you you have a certain connection between them because you know, like formalists famously they um, 
I was struck by this quote, uh, uh, clinical self-description of a Russian prophet, because formalists actually themselves quite like, yeah, they they were into this uh, clinical self-mythologization as a prophet, uh -huh. and not to mention how it honestly connects to the this entire tradition of the pro prophet, poet, prophet. So the, the, it's a very original perspective uh, on, on these kind of questions. So thank you for that. My question is also about the genre. Um, and uh, this uh, example, um, Vertinian of Parodies, Push, Pushkin's mystif like mystifies after autobiography, right? Or not, or like not after memoir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's it's interesting that you say that Yana's genre is a biography. Mm -hmm. And I am just wondering like, if the Yana genre is a biography, but Shlosky genre is autobiography. Mm -hmm. And what actually the Yana parodies in this fragment about Pushkin is a kind of like a similar genre mm -hmm. of like a mystified self-description, which Shkowski, his beloved friend, was very much uh, the master of. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if this kind of, um, if this poses some kind of like internal contradiction uh, in the, this, like, the different difference between the methods and uh, of Antonian's biography and Shkowski's autobiography. Uh, thank you. It's, very, it's a very interesting question. So, uh, so maybe this idea of a novel being a synthetic genre to okay. explain it, um, he structures it as a biography, but also as a journey, uh, because he literally takes uh, Gribayev uh, on the same routes as first um, from Petersburg to Moscow, like Rajinshiv did, and then from uh, Petersburg to Tbilisi, like Pushkin and uh, Shkolsky did, and then from Tbilisi to Tabriz, like Shkolsky did. So, um, and a, a, a lot of time Gribayeta was spending um, traveling. So he kind of uh, com combines biography and a travelogue uh, as a genre. Also about the mystifications, um, the Nyanas novel also is completely it's completely based on mystifications. On the one hand, he kind of, just like uh, Pushkin did in, in the journey for us, who makes us believe that it's very kind of scholarly rigorous. On the other hand, he intentionally, for example, when he mentions um, like uh, Grimaud ended up being invited for a dinner by one person, he uh, for sure knows who, who that person was and he kind of replaces it and makes some other person invite him. And there is um, all the time we can find this kind of little mystifications. Uh, so, yeah, I'm happy you mentioned that. Uh, first, thank you so much for this presentation and your wonderful book. Um, I was also very curious about the dissertation novel form, so I'll jump onto that pile too. Um, and one thing I appreciated was your um, kind of like dual attention to like the reciprocal relationship between his theory and fiction, not only just the way that his theory can be applied to his fiction, but also how his fiction might be this kind of testing ground for later theory down the road, um, which especially struck me given the year that the article on Pushkin comes out um, and your example with the Samovar in Christianity, which it seems like uh, in its original fictional um, manifestation uh, maybe provides the uh, like loosened loosened space for him to kind of play with or like creatively misread Pushkin that will then down the road you know be able to be turned into a certain theory and so I was, I was kind of curious about your general thoughts about um, how this process of fiction to theory has changed your perception of uh, Tignano's creative process as a theorist and whether you found other instances of that same fiction to theory pipeline. Yeah, I can't think of other examples now, but I know that um, when formalism was denounced, uh, it was a kind of a big blow for Tenyana, and he viewed fiction as this kind of a second-rate thing that he has to do because he cannot uh, be engaged in, in his scholarly work. Uh, but then it seems that um, it kind of was this uh, testing grounds for, for his ideas. So I think uh, maybe he just had to do it through fiction, 
until it crystallizes and he, he uh, kind of comes up with something else. Another thing I wanted, it didn't, I didn't talk about it during the presentation, but uh, it seems that the Nyanov, um, he also alludes to his own times. So all these things also allude to, uh, for example, Bolsheviks regaining back the, the former empire. And also he himself, it seems that felt um, a little bit um, guilty that he is surviving and collaborating in the same way that he thought Pushkin did when he wrote some of his later, later works. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I, I answered your question. Um, I feel like I'm, my question um, sounds like it will be kind of paraphrasing probably ones that people have already asked, but I was um, struck by your kind of clear juxtaposition of the futurists and the formalists as sort of more nationalist in their treatment of the Middle East or Persia as opposed to the formalists being kind of proto um, you know, the colonial theorists. And I was wondering where the, what's the role of literary theory, I suppose. I mean, it could also just be personalities, right? Mm -hmm. Different people with their own kind of ideologies and backgrounds. But I wonder if the fact that they're kind of theorists yeah. plays a role in, in looking at this material and a different way. Yeah, I think that the fact that there were theorists and there were thinkers made them think more deeply and see some kind of historical connections that the futurists probably uh, didn't. Uh, they, they were more kind of on emotional level. Um, so it, it's one of Tanyana's favorite uh, ideas that um, the avant-garde is shaking the hands of the Enlightenment over the heads of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So I think probably them study being also not only theorists, but also literary scholars, uh, literary critics, and studying the literature, they maybe could see and compare and uh, come up with this, uh, um, those yeah, mm -hmm. distinctions. Um, you know, I hope the, the virtual Audiences, audience also has questions. Uh, you know, if not, I have quite a few of my own. But and, and the, yeah, let's start with him. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Anya. This is this is really uh, wonderful, and and I um, really appreciate the the way in which you make uh, this painstaking philological work resonate with our time. Um, I I have a Quick question. Uh, one of the things that seems to me from unfortunately somewhat distant recollection from the novel that seems to me to have been prominent in it is the whole idea of this trading company, right? This mm -hmm. Transcaucasian trading company, which he's conceiving and sort of struggling with and so on. And, um, and one of the things that, again, you know, recalling the novel, I'm remembering is that this one of the prominent aspects of the critique of imperialism that we find in in Tanyanov in particular is uh, his critique also of capitalism, mm -hmm. which makes of course a lot of sense given the the soil out of which it comes. From that point of view, it is sort of a, a more multifaceted critique than we find in Said even, mm -hmm. right? So in a certain sense, it's uh, more right more more slightly slightly differently minded critique but nevertheless you know and so i don't know to what extent but would have for example been familiar with uh you know lenin's uh, imperialism as the highest state yeah or, definitely yeah he was also a parody of being right. yeah. <laughs> okay. or 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 Mikhail work on 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 settler colonialism and, and stuff like that, which was contemporary more or less at the time. So I just wonder, you know, that aspect, it, 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 this, this, this question is um, an homage to our, our colleague and friend, Rosson, whose, uh, whose work is um, so prominently uh, embedded in this problematic. Uh -huh, yeah, it's very interesting. So, um, 
At that time, when Kadenyana was writing the book, uh, there are two texts, three texts. There are two texts uh, of the proposal, which um, Gribayedov wrote uh, in uh, collaboration with Peter Zavilevsky in Tiflis. Uh, Zavilevsky was a uh, governor of Tiflis at that time, uh, very shortly before, before his death. So the idea was uh, to ask for privileges and monopolies in the same way like a British East India Company had from the government. Uh, now the critic at that time when Tatiana was writing the novel, they thought that the critic was a Decemberist uh, Bourteau. Mm. Um, and later they found out it wasn't Bourteau, but it was a Tsarist General Zhukovsky. <laughs> It was very interesting that the idea of the Tsarist General Zhukovsky are very similar to the idea of what the Decemberists would, would think. Um, there was a, a kind of a fear of capitalism creating a second uh, aristocracy of wealth, mm -hmm. which would be just replacing the aristocracy of, by, uh, by birth of, of nobility. But I think, uh, in general, the criticism wasn't, um, I don't think it, in general, Zhukovsky's criticism wasn't uh, anti-capitalist. It was pro-capitalist, but pro-free trade in, from the point of view like of Adam Smith. Yes. And again, against monopolies. Um, I don't but think- But then Tignana, Tignana's take on it is- um, a little bit. It just hints. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can't say for sure that he, he, yeah, that he actually. Uh, I guess the the, the this the criticism was already in General Zhukovsky. It's it's interesting that already in General Zhukovsky's comments you see this idea that of uh, whatever divider is proposing is unfair. Uh, it will create very fast uh, stratification, very fast, uh, the monopoly will be, become very rich and then others will be poor. But I don't think Zhukovsky was against capitalism, it was more of like level level ground. Non-monopoly. Yeah, no. yeah non-monopoly, non that yeah, we trade capitalism. With Stenyanov, I'm not sure, maybe he's hinting that, uh, but I don't think he develops this idea very uh, distinctly in, in the um, That is how I'll ask my question, you know, um, but I, I do hope maybe the, the virtual audience will also produce questions of their own, but uh, um, and my question maybe comes uh, from, from Elias and uh, is about actually, uh, can we periodize uh, the formalists, and um, you know, the Yanos in particular, the formalists um, more generally, and, and the avant garde's uh, engagement with questions of, of uh, empire and, and imperialism. We uh, have a very general sense of, um, of uh, this periodization in the, in the realm of history, thanks to. Alexei Golubyov's article, and probably you haven't come across it, but uh, in, in which uh, he associates the school of Pokrovsky. Pokrovsky, yes, there, there was, uh, he, he renames the Pokrovsky school into um, an early Soviet school of anti imperial. Yes, sorry, I forgot, but, but essentially, uh, you know, which is a school that uh, reaches its apogee in the uh, in the second half of the 1920s, and then with the uh, rise of national, you know, national Bolshevism uh, in, in the 30s is suppressed together with, with the whole Brodsky school. And, uh, but but I wonder how this periodization in the historicals uh, in the history sphere. Um, corresponds to uh, to literary scholars and avant-garde artists engage, engagement with it in terms of its historical arc. It's probably the same uh, 1920s where at the time when they uh, openly could criticize imperialism. Um, after that, uh, in Pushkin, for example, instead of 
kind of abstaining from criticizing imperialism, but portraying it, uh, Tenyatov goes simply into describing Pushkin's personal life more in detail and just living out the political stuff. So it's not that they like change their ideas, they just uh, disengage with, with, them, with them. And yeah, uh, uh, with kind of uh, the idea of Stalinism, of the, uh, the lesser evil, that uh, imperialism was positive overall because uh, because of this civilizing mission. Um, uh, we, we see much less of that, you know, it's criticism uh, among, among, among that also. Any last question? Quick question. Um, do we find, do we find, if I, I, I glanced through the book uh, quickly and read some sections, but um, I do I remember correctly that you discuss a kind of post-Soviet um, adaptation of Denyanov's novel? I wonder what, what happens there? Yeah, so what happens there is um uh, tell a novel, tell a tell tell yeah, TV series, uh, there's TV series. 10, I think ten uh, episodes of it. Yeah. So uh so I look at it from the perspective of Bakhtin, which talks about objectivization of parody. He says, if um, we read a parody and we don't recognize it as a parody, uh, then it becomes objectivized and we kind of believe the, the value of what is said yeah. without seeing irony in it. Uh, so in Netanyahu's case, if we don't see it as a critique of Orientalism, that it by itself it becomes an Orientalist piece. And I think uh, that to a certain degree, that's what the filmmakers <laughs> did. <laughs> they took his anti-orientalist piece and made a very orientalist movie. Mm -hmm. I was especially uh, angry about the way they portrayed the, the, the unit. Oh, yeah. Because in Pinyana's novel, he's portrayed as somebody um, um, by his intellect and his looks equal to be by end of, but in the film is uh, like uh, kneeling in front of him. And so, but then the same with uh, all that many other aspects. Although they do have some kind of hints, um, for example, they portray um, uh, Grybayedov in a triangular head like Napoleon, mm -hmm. which kind of hints to his kind of ego and his desire to be, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anya. This thank was you. really, really wonderful and an education to all of us.